Today we're going to talk about designing a circuit that will flash four LEDs in a ping pong pattern. Now here's a sneak preview of the finished product. Always start out by putting the problem description down in writing, no matter how simple, obvious, or intuitive it might be. You'd be really surprised how much it'll help you throughout the project. Now we're going to approach this as a state-oriented design. And one of the ways that we could solve this problem is by having a state machine that's called a round robin, which means it just simply transitions from one state to the next without any real decision-making process. And all of our desired behavior comes from the fact that it's stepping through these states. In this case, we would need six states because we would have to start off with the first LED on, second LED on, third LED on, fourth LED on, and then the third LED on, second LED on, and back to the first. So in order to do what we want, ping pong back and forth between four LEDs, we would need six states. Now this is a more machine, and uh, the notation shows you the state number here and the output below. So here we have uh, a sequence of LEDs, a binary sequence, the bit that's on shows the LED, and these are the state numbers that go from 0 through 5. And we will look at the advantages and disadvantages of this and the other machines in a minute. Now here's another approach we could take. This state machine only has four states. We only have four LEDs, so each one of these states can tell one of the LEDs to turn on, if you will. Um, but what we'll have to do with this machine is be a little bit more smart about which direction we're moving. The other one was a round robin. We never had to make any decisions about where we're going to go next. But here we have to make decisions about where we're going to go next. And to do that, we use something called a direction bit. And the way this is going to work is we're going to sense the input of a direction bit, and we're also going to set the direction bit. So along the top here, you'll see the direction bits that we're sensing are all zero, and that's telling the states to move in this direction, move upward. Down here, we see that the input direction bit is a one all the way across here. That's telling it to move this way. So in this state, we sense a zero as an input, and we know that we're going to move this way, and since we're moving this way, we set the output as a zero. This continues up through here until we get to this state, where we sense a zero, we know, we know we're supposed to move to state one, one, but we set a one to tell the next state to turn it around and move it back the other way. Now there are a couple interesting things about this. Uh, if you will notice that the direction bit tends to track the most significant bit of the states, but it does so in two different ways. One is that the existing state will set the most significant bit of its own state as the output bit. So you'll see here the MSB here is the output here, the MSB here is the output here, same here, this is the output, um, the one here is the output. So this first number here is the direction bit being sensed by the state and to know which direction to move into. And the second number here is the bit that's being set by the state as it's moving to the next state. Uh, now, when we're in these two states right here, it's most obvious that if this state sees a zero, it can move here. If it sees a one, it can move here. Same here. This can move here on a zero or here on a one. There are some conditions that might occur at the end. This might start, this might occur in a startup position, as a startup condition. This might happen sometime by some sort of noise in the system, but we always like to have a safety net just in case the unexpected happens. So again, we will look at the pros and cons of this, but this is a mealy machine, and um, it has the unique condition of being able to use the state bits straight into a decoder to control the LED. So we don't need to decode the LED status, we just output these state bits into a, four, a two to four line decoder and have that drive the LEDs for us. Well, now that we've had a chance to look at a couple different architectures that we might choose from, let's look at the pros and cons of each. That Moore machine that was the round robin affair 
was nice in that it just cycled from one state to the next every time we had a clock cycle. There were no decisions that needed to be made. It just continued on merrily just from one state to the next. It always knew which state it was going to go to next, and that ne never varied. So that is an advantage. But the cons are that it needed six states, and any time you go beyond four states, you're going to have to add another flip-flop because we need three bits uh, for six states. So we can get up to eight states with three bits, but we're going to need three bits to do six states. So that's an extra flip-flop and extra logic and everything else that goes along with that. Also, what we're going to, this is probably the main detriment to that approach that since we have states from zero to five, we're going to have com combinatorial logic that's going to have to figure out when to turn on the LEDs, and this could get relatively complex. Now let's take a look at that four-state mealy machine. The pros are that it only requires two flip-flops because it's only got four states. Also, the state bits can be used directly to control the LED outputs by running them through a decoder or a demultiplexer. This is extremely useful. It cuts out a tremendous amount of logic out of the circuit. So just for this sake right here, that's a very attractive option. The cons are that we need some kind of additional logic to tell it which direction it's supposed to move in. And that could get to be a little bit trickier than it might look like at first. I've decided that this four-state mealing machine would be a lot more interesting to pursue because what we can do is we can just figure out how to handle this direction bit. And the output of the LEDs can be decoded through a two to four line decoder, like a 74LS139. And we don't have to worry about a whole bunch of combinatorial logic. We can concentrate on the architecture of the system, which would be more intriguing. Now here you notice that I have a note that says the direction bit output, that's the second, the number after the slash, that's the output. So the direction bit output tracks the most significant bit of the current state, meaning the state that it just came from. So in this transition, you'll see that you have a zero here, second number. Here we have a zero. Here we have a one. So here we have a one matches this one. So you see it works all the way around. However, the direction bit input, which is the number on the left side of the slash, the first number, that tracks the most significant bit of the previous state. Now, here's what I mean by this. Let's just say that we output a zero here like we're supposed to. Well, when we get here, everything is fine, right? Because we're in this state, we see, we read an input of zero when we know that we're supposed to move on to this state. We output a zero. When we get to this state, though, something interesting happens. We see that it's not quite as simple as it might appear on the surface. Here, we're supposed to read the input as zero because this one, this one has sent a zero to, to control this state to move it in this direction. So you can see here that our rule of our output continues to, to work but our input, that bit doesn't match the most significant bit of this state. It matches the most significant bit of this state. And if you look at that, it's a, another rule that we can make that, say, that says that this input bit will always match the most significant bit of the previous state. So this matches this, this matches this, this matches this, see, because it's back this way, this matches this, and you can see here that here's our input, see that matches that, and then we move back this way, and this matches that. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to handle that bit so that when it comes to a state like this, that it's not reading its own MSB as an input, it's reading the MSB of the previous state. And that means we need um, a memory of sorts. We basically have to latch this bit and save it for the next state so that we can move in the right direction. And that's basically the whole trick of this circuit.
The four state mealing machine is very simple in terms of its layout. We only have one input bit, which is our direction bit. And we only have one output bit, which is our direction bit. So we have an input direction bit and we have an output direction bit. Otherwise, it's just very simple. We can look at our state diagram and we can see that we go from state 0, 0 to state 0, 1 when the direction bit is 0. If it's 1, we need to fix it because that's kind of an error condition. So we'll go from 0, 0 to 0, 0, but then we'll fix it next time around and we can move on to the next state. So each one of these states shows whether to move forward or backwards. Um, the first state and the last state or the first and last LED are not going to be uh, any real decision making there because they this one has to move back this way, this one has to move down here. But these two right here have to make a decision whether to move on this direction or back that direction. Same here, does this move up or does it move down? Now this direction bit is going to be um, very much simplified in one way because we know that it relates to the most significant bit of the state. So we're going to look at how we can make life easier for ourselves by simply using that bit and delaying it for one state. Now that we've got our next state table, we move on to our Karnoff maps. Now remember in this methodology, the steps we take are first we have a good written description of the problem. Then we put our thoughts into producing a state machine from that written description. At each stage, if you're working with anyone, you should review the design with them, the high level architecture, to make sure that everybody agrees that you're on the right track. So after you have produced your state diagram, that matches your written description, then you put the state diagram information into tabular form and you also figure out what your JK flip-flop excitation table is going to be. So now we take that information from the JK flip-flop part of the state next state table and we create our Karnoff maps. From our Karnoff maps we can simplify and remember it's important to always make sure that you reorient um, any numbers both as your input or as your state bit so that you only have one bit changing at a time. So this is basically a gray code. You notice that go, instead of going from 0, 1, 2, 3, it goes 0, 1, 3, 2. And this is to allow only one state bit to change at a time and therefore allow us great more flexibility in simplifying um, the Karnoff map. Now from the Karnoff map we get our Boolean equations for uh, all of our variables. Here we have our J1 and our J1 flip-flop, the, the first flip-flop, first JK flip-flop. We have J1 is the direction bit not and the Q0 bit positive. So the K1 is going to be the direction bit positive and the Q0 bit negative. And we have for, these are ands and these are ors. You see here you have this and this, this is an and, this is, this is combined with this into an and. But here we have an or situation. We have this is an and or in this case it's canceled out all the way across all of these variables and we're only left with this direction bit not. But here we have another situation. This cannot be combined with this. This is two different scenarios and therefore it's either this or this. Here we have either this or this. Now down here just for the sake of the exercise I have taken the bits that we would normally be setting for direction bits and I have created a little Karnoff map for that and sure enough it verifies that the direction bit is actually the Q1 bit or the most significant bit of the state variable. Here we have a little shorthand saying that let's not worry about the Karnoff map for all of the LED outputs which by the way got fairly complicated I did work them out Let's forget about all that and just run our state bits into a 
either a three to eight line decoder and only use two lines or a two to four line decoder. And let's get our LED control going that way so that we can save a lot of space. So now that we've got our information from our Karnoff maps, we can go ahead and design our circuit. Uh, by the way, all of this material, including this schematic, is available if you just contact me. I'd be more than glad to send it to you. Here we have the 107, which is the dual JK flip-flop. That's all we need for the circuit because we only have two states. And down here we're using a D flip-flop, actually a dual D flip-flop, which is a 74LS74, in order to do our delay. Here we have a 555 timer. And the way this timer works is it drives both of these clocks on the negative edge for the JK flip-flop and it drives these D flip-flops on the positive edge. And we don't have to do any inversion, that's just the way that these devices work. But that's actually an advantage because what it does is it gives us a little bit of a phase shift. So this will clock, everything will stabilize and then when the clock goes positive this will read this uh, Q bit here which is essentially your uh, Q1 bit. This Q1 bit which is your most significant bit of the uh, state variable comes down into this D flip-flop. So you have a state change on the negative clock. It reads all the input out here and it changes state. Of course it takes time. It's not instantaneous. A couple nanoseconds. Now this is stable and then a good while later we have a positive edge on this clock here and this information here, well only one bit that we're interested in which is the uh, Q1 bit, the most significant bit, it gets latched into this D flip-flop. Now what happens is that on the next state when the clock goes low it reads all of the input but let's just take a look we had a previous state, but let's just follow this one bit. Essentially we've latched the bit from that state into here. The next clock it's going to move over to here and it will be apparent on the output of this. Nice also that these chips have um, a, a negative, you know, positive and negative output. So this is Q and Q naught on all of these chips. So we don't have to have a bunch of inverters in here, which is really nice. So anyway, we've, we've captured this bit, our most significant bit, our direction bit, and then on the next state, it transfers it over to here where now it's available to this combinatorial logic based on those Boolean equations in our Karnoff map. So now it's over here, and it gets read in one state later. So essentially, bottom line is that we're taking this Q1 bit, we're putting into this flip-flop, and then on the next cycle it's flipping over here so that's given us one state delay, one clock delay. Also what we're doing is very good design practice. We're not doing everything on the same clock edge. This is a synchronous design so let's use the advantages of synchronous design and let's use the positive and negative edges of the clock. So as the clock goes negative we're we're latching things or we're reading the inputs to the JK flip-flops and we're setting the outputs accordingly and then when the clock goes positive after that we're reading those stable inputs into this delay circuit down here. So one of the tricks that I like to do when I'm drawing these circuits is when you, you know that you're going to be dealing with a various set of variables. If you look at your Karnoff map Boolean equations. And here I know that I've got Q, Q0, Q1, Q1 naught, Q0, and Q0 naught, which are coming off of this JK flip-flop. I will draw lines like a bus all the way across the entire page. And I will run these signals up to those lines, to that bus, and then I will pull them off over here as I need them. Same thing down here, you see I've just run these two lines across here which is our dir and our dir not. These ran all the way across the page, just as these ran all the way across the page. And I grab these labels and I, and I set those labels up several places so that I can always see what signals I have. 
And then when you get finished, what all you do is you trim this down. You just take off all the excess baggage here and you're left with this really nice clean schematic. But you start off with those buses running all the way across the page. Another thing that I always do is I always write the Boolean equations off my Karnoff maps right on the outputs of these uh, gates, this combinatorial logic that's setting up the inputs for the next state and whatever else is going on out here. Or if you had logic out here instead of this nice decoder that we're using now, if you had all this logic out here that was controlling the LEDs, I would write the Boolean equations next to the output of each one of those gates. And over here we have our uh, 74 LS138 which is a 3 to 8 line. I'm only using A0 and A1. I've taken A3 to ground. We're also not using for the outputs. So you could design a circuit like this that could run 8 LEDs back and forth. Of course you would need another JK flip-flop pair in order to uh, actually just one more flip-flop but they come in pairs so that you would have to have one more chip in order to do eight states. But anyway, here's the, here's the circuit, and, and it's fairly simple, as you can see. And by the way, I did sketch out all of the other choices that I had talked about. I, you know, that six-state machine, um, using the um, combinatorial logic out to the LEDs and all this, and they were much more complex than this turned out to be. So this is... Um, really, I don't know what it is, it, uh, six chips or something like that, not too bad. So, I will show you the actual circuit now. And so, here's the circuit. As usual, I'm using a 9-volt battery going through an LM7805 to give me a regulated 5-volt level VCC on, the, on these power bars here. Uh, that way I can run any kind of battery. I can use uh, up to 36 volts on the input and it will give me a nice 5 volt level for my logic chips. Here I'm using uh, a 555 timer. This is actually a TLC555, the CMOS version. Um, two resistors and a capacitor give me my timing. Um, and it doesn't take up much space. It's really nice. So here is the uh, 107 which is the dual JK flip-flop. Here is my 7474 dual D flip-flop. Here is the combination lock. It's 708. We have uh, uh, AND gates, quad two input AND gates. Here we have the um, 7432, which is quad two input OR gates. And here we have the uh, 138, which is the 3 to 8 line decoder, which as I said, I'm only using 4 lines. So you can see it really, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 chips. And um, I actually have some chips, uh, some gates left over. So um, it's really a nice, clean, simple circuit. And the whole trick of the thing is to allow the 138 to decode the LED outputs and then um, the real trick to this circuit was figuring out how that Q1 state bit is going to be used to control the direction and how it needs to be delayed by one state.